Julia running around. Okay, I just let everybody in. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are going to wait just a few minutes uh, so folks can trickle in um, and we'll get started in a few minutes. Thanks. We'll just give it maybe about one more minute um, and then we'll get started. Okay, uh, we'll, we're gonna get started. Uh, first of all, just wanted to say thank you for everybody uh, who have uh, joined us tonight. We had about 32 people registered, so I'm sure more people are gonna uh, trickle in as the night goes on. Um, but thank you for coming to the Upcountry Virtual Town Hall that is being hosted by Senator Lynn DeCoit and Representative Kyle Yamashita. And really the purpose of tonight's meeting is to allow the community a opportunity uh, to connect with our legislators um, and for them to share updates on what's going on in the district. Um, before we get to tonight's program, just wanted to share a few reminders that if you haven't muted yourself yet, please do. Um, there is going to be an opportunity for question and answer. So if you do have a question, uh, please put it in the chat. Um, or if you want to ask your question live, uh, please raise your virtual hand uh, or try to get my attention. Um, and we're going to ask that you keep your question or comments to two minutes. Um, so with that, uh, we'll get started and we'll get to some opening remarks from Senator DeCoit um, and then Representative Yamashita. So Senator DeCoit, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Jacob, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight. Um, as you know, technology has done wonders for many of us. You know, we appreciate the fact that we can go live and have the uh, personal conversation via technology. Uh, like Jacob said, you know, it's an opportunity for us to give you guys updates about what we're doing. Um, so I'd like to, first of all, thanks, thank you, Jacob, for handling the communications for us. Uh, Rep Yamashita, who's my counterpart in District 12, for joining us, as well as the staff that we have online. Uh, my office manager, Becca, Rebecca, um, Sharon Lumpo, uh, Richard Oshiro. Um, so some of the things we've been working on, uh, COVID has been a trying time for many of us, as we have been working through the interim, addressing everything from unemployment issues to COVID, to getting resources out into the district. Um, as most of you know, the district is a canoe district uh, for myself and Senate District 7, which entails the islands of Molokai, Lanai, all of upcountry and East Maui, as well as Molokini and Ko'olawe. Uh, we have been trying to address many of the issues um, and not all the issues for the district will be the same as others. So the priorities that come before us all depends upon the district and the needs of those individuals. Um, be it education, be it agriculture, invasive species and environmental and climate change. So, you know, we've been working across the aisle myself uh, at one time with Representative Yamashita prior to being appointed to the Senate, uh, which I'm very honored to serve and work with each and every one of you. Um, and I know that there's a lot of questions that are out there. So without, uh, taking up a lot of time and before I pass the floor on to Representative Yamashita, 
we do have a survey that is out there uh, and we will drop it in the chat. You can help us by answering the survey so we can help set priorities in the different areas of the community and district. Also, we provide an e-blast every Friday to send out information of also what's going on in the district. And by all means, please feel free to ask the questions and we're here to happily answer them, answer them. And I would like to turn the floor over now to Representative Yamashita. Mahalo. Thank you very much, Senator Dekoit. Um, first of all, I'd like to, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I ever publicly congratulated you, but congratulations. I think you do a great job for, uh, for Maui and, and serving in the, the, the Senate district that uh, we, we were so lucky to have Senator English uh, serve for so many years. I think, um, um, you know, we, uh, Lynn and I have worked together for, for many years and I think we work well together. So I'm kind of excited that we get to work on similar issues that may help uh, or, or benefit the district. Um, uh, it's always great to have a great partner that you feel comfortable communicating with and um, um, and working. You know, I think we work well together, so I'm really, really excited about that. Um, you know, we um, we actually, you know, we went through some trying times uh, with COVID, and I think everybody's aware of that. But uh, you know, I think uh, the good news is that um, you know we, we have gotten uh, a lot of help from the federal government. And that has kind of um, made it easier for us to, to, to get through these uh, tough times. And, um, you know, we um, are currently monitoring uh, the new infrastructure bill that is coming through. Um, there are some things in there that uh, uh, we are in conversations with Senator Schatz's office and um, um, in the area of broadband. And I'm kind of excited about that because that's going to be a huge infusion um, to not only take care of an aging um, system uh, statewide, but also um, how do how do we um, provide services to um, rural areas and you know under underserved areas and you know people that actually need um, and and trying to figure out how to make that work right, working with the private sector and the university and you know, the other state departments that, that need these services also. So those are some of the things that uh, this past interim we're working on. Um, uh, you know, I'll just stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, so we did receive a few questions uh, prior to tonight's meeting uh, from folks. So maybe we'll get started with some of those questions um, and then we can go to the audience questions that we have here. So just a reminder to the audience, if you have a question for either Senator DeCoit or Representative Yamashita, uh, please put it in the chat um, or raise your virtual hand and we'll get to you. Um, but really uh, one of the questions we got, um, uh, we actually got quite a few, so uh, we'll, we'll take it. Uh, one question and comment uh, came from a resident and the comment was, why is it every year that we say there is no money to get educators to the pay scale uh, that they have earned, saving the state up to 50 million annually, yet we never ask the wealthy to make similar sacrifices? Um, you know, so I, I, I think where this question is going is, you know, uh, definitely income tax, you know, and, and, and how do we get or how do we create a progressive tax structure? Um, you know, so I know that question is kind of all over the place, but maybe we'll point to Representative Yamashita first, since you are the CIP chair for the House Finance Committee, um, and then maybe we can go to Senator DeCoit to also take a stab at that question. Yeah, to, to do a, um, a tax that taxes the rich, I think the difficult part about um, historically what has happened, and you know, it's, cur it's currently happening right now, and that's always been the challenge that I'm trying to figure out is um, the higher we make um, income tax on the, the top tier, the more they export, uh, meaning they will um, be part-time residents or maybe, you know, it's hard for us to track that, but, um, and they'll claim residency in another state and they'll uh, pay income there where there's either lower income taxes or no income taxes. So the, the um, it's, it's kind of um, diminishing returns where we're having difficulty um, 
finding that balance. It's always been my belief that um, uh, part of the solution is uh, we are the only state where um, education, community hospital, jails, traffic court, and even ambulance service. Um, these services are normally paid for at the county level. We're the only state where it's primarily paid for on the state level. And because of that, it is not paid for out of property tax. Um, over seven, uh, over 30 percent of the land in the state of Hawaii is owned by people that are out of state and yet we do not tax them um, accordingly uh, at a higher rate to, 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 to offset that. Um, we, um, it, we need some kind of structural change that um, I think that'll, that'll address what you're trying to get at. And I think what you're trying to get at is, um, you know, how do we properly fund education? And, um, and one of it is that we are structurally different. And, and, many, and, and it's, it's, it's that way primarily because at statehood, uh, it was uh, difficult for um, the counties to do education. So the, uh, the counties to do uh, all those five things that I mentioned. And so the state took on most of that and, and we became a very centralized state. But, but you know, today we are a different state. Um, we still have pockets that have, will have that challenge, which, which includes um, Senator Decoit's areas, which is uh, Molokai, Lanai, Lanai and, um, and Hana those areas. Um, I think, uh, you know, a, a, to be a centralized state has some benefits where we can evenly spread resources to those rural um, areas. So I think there's some upside to that, but to find the balance is always the challenge. It is something that I've been working on for a very, very long time. Um, we are still trying to gather more information to make the public understand that these changes need to be made because at the end of the day, the biggest challenge is that whenever you make uh, a big change like this, somebody loses. And usually those people that lose will start screaming the loudest. And um, our job, I think, is to make, find something that's fair. And that's what we're trying to look for. So I'll turn it over to Senator Quick. Thanks, Rep. Mm. So, so thank you, Rep. Yamashita. And of course, you know, we have had this conversation while I was in the house and um, Rep. Yamashita has spent a lot of time and effort, whether it be, um, you know, better pay for our teachers so that we're there to make sure the next generation is at the competitive level of education as, as others are across the U.S. You know, it's, it's challenging, uh, just what he said, you know, we are the only state that the schools fall under our previous was hospitals and, um, you know, prisons, you know, trying to find that balance and whether or not we are within the just to uh, put higher taxes on some of the wealthiest. Uh, again, you know, some of these things, um, the conversation that we have had, not just with myself and Representative Yamashita, but many of our colleagues is, how do we look at those areas? Because most of the neighbor islands, um, we find ourselves at a disadvantage. So it really takes us pulling a lot of our uh, mana'o together because urban Honolulu is the bulk of where the, our taxes are generated. So we literally fight tooth and nail to bring funds back. So it has to be a buy-in of not just your neighbor island reps and senators, but that of urban Honolulu. Um, you take the you take Hana and uh, Lanai and Molokai, for example. Student weighted formula has been designed um, where they do not have the resources that they need because of the amount of enrollment that they have. So every year, as we try to plead that case, uh, you know, we know that there are teachers that are doing a uh, double, triple subject matters of teaching, and yet because of enrollment, it has cost us a lot not to have our kids educated at that level. Um, as we move forward um, and looking at the different tax structures, you know, this is a place where I think, you know, we need to have that conversation even moving forward. Maybe some of the legislation needs to change where the county does take on some of this. And then we offset those taxes via property tax. I think, um, those are one of the conversations that Representative Yamashita and myself has had because I am always jumping up and down 
in saying that, you know, if you live in HANA, your distance of driving, the disadvantage of us having teachers at a disadvantage, which is why, you know, we were very supportive of those hard to uh, uh, fund teachers actually moving in those rural areas was used as a differential in pay. You know, I was very grateful to my colleagues as well as Representative Yamashita that became supportive because we just couldn't get teachers in areas like that along with, um, you know, Lanai. You look at the cost of living on these islands, people come into, uh, from the mainland to teach and then, you know, they bounce from place to place. So I, I do agree that there needs to be an adjustment in some kind of tax structure on the wealthiest um as you guys just saw we had the second richest person buy a home on the kia side of, of maui and you know what is the contribution you're looking at resources also being depleted the infrastructure of roads being used more so we want to see what's the skin in the game and you know as we move forward again it really helps when you know individuals do also reach out to our urban core areas of state representatives and senators that will truly make the difference on how we uh, go forward. So thank you for the question. Thanks, Senator. Um, you know what, we'll go to Dick. I know Dick had a question. So Dick, if you're able to unmute and you wanted to ask your question live, uh, you can do so at this time. Thank you very much. Question I have regarding the State Department of Taxation and how effective it is in collecting taxes uh, from in operations that are here in Hawaii but are paid for on the mainland, for, whether let's say Hertz or United Airlines, somebody buys a ticket on Expedia or uh, Hertz and they pay for it in Illinois. How good is our state tax department able to get those revenues? And that also goes for all the out of state people who own uh, vacation rentals and whether they're paying, and there's several taxes in that case, and it might be the GET, transient accommodation tax, and income tax. And so I'm just wondering, the, the state tax department has been very quiet about how good they are. And years ago I asked, and they said that they have very weak auditing department. And if that's still the case now, um, we may be under collecting a large amount of revenue for business operations here in Hawaii. I'd like to hear your response to that, and particularly from uh, Representative Yamashita, who's on the Finance Committee, and I know this is of interest to you. You want to know how to spend the money, but we need to collect a lot more. Right. Um, thank you very much for that question, Dick. The, um, you know, we, I just actually had a couple of meetings with the uh, new tax director, um, Isaac Choi, and, um, you know, his goal was to go after all these um, um, uh, companies that uh, do all the state money that, you know, um, the scenarios that you gave us. So he is in the process of meeting with them and negotiating um, an agreement. Um, I think he has been very, very successful. Um, his strategy is um, um, more from a, how much time does the department have uh, to spread resources to go after this. So it's, he, he wants right, a good ROI. So he's kind of going after um, the bigger ones first. Um, so he's, he's, he's targeting that first. He sees, his comment to me was, you know, if it's not at least a million dollars, he's not wasting his time on it right now. Um, so the, um, the smaller individuals that you mentioned, I think are, are gonna, you know, be um, done hopefully by, um, him making examples of the bigger guys, and some of them will start to comply. Uh, I am I'm very uh, hopeful that um, you know. Unfortunately, he's he was appointed late in the EGA uh, administration's um, um, you know time, and uh, and that's coming to an end. But he is very very aggressive in going after out of state taxes that is owed to the state. It even goes so far as the county. Uh, working with the with the state, um, vacation rentals is one example. You mentioned they're not going after them. Setting examples there because we have on Maui, pro let's say seven thousand, ten thousand vacation rentals that are probably owned out of state, maybe even abroad, and setting some examples of going after them and with penalties, not just you know collecting uh, eighty dollars here, hundred dollars here, but actually with significant penalties if they're not pay paying their proper share, and 
this, the county now is going to be having uh, every vacation rental will have to, um, many of them will have to have a tax number. And I would love the county tax department and the state to cooperate, to work together on exchanging information of that kind. And I would like you to see you facilitate that because the, the it has not been happening in the past between the property tax people and the state. Yeah, that, that conversation is happening. Um, and it, um, it was initiated by um, the bill that the legislature just passed to give the county the authority to collect the TAT. So um, they started uh, communicating with their um, revenue people. And um, I know uh, all four counties are in conversations with the tax department at this time. Good, I hope you're aggressive. Thanks, Rep. Senator, any, anything to add on that? Sorry, so just as a follow up, Dick, um, I think we have probably one of the strongest people at the Department of Taxation, which is um, Director Choi. Um, he comes from a background of a CPA. He's probably the most shrewdest person that you have to work with. And he is going after a lot. I mean, I think we had a bill, but I think we had a bill. Um, and this also, when you talk about going after these bigger airlines and bigger companies, Amazon became top dog on the list of literally many of us that have utilized Amazon. Um, he had questioned at that time, we want the taxes off of there. Um, these are things that has been at the top of director choice uh, bucket list. Again, I agree with you, we have not um, really worked hard enough with um, the counties because I think we have penny annied uh, vacation rentals and those vacation rentals, one, um, that are in violation should be set an example first and foremost. I mean, why are we like not hitting them at a $10,000 fine that if you're not in compliance? You know, I do know that there are vacation rentals that are in compliance um, they are paying their taxes, which is what we want. I mean, we want to upgrade our infrastructure. We want schools to be better emergency services. But at what point if we continue to penny any this along? So I have to tell you, I've worked with uh, Director Troy in the past. Um, as a CPA, he has balanced those books to the last penny. Um, and he, um, I hope within the next administration that he also is retained so that we can continue on this path. Because as you know, the state had had a computer system that was antiquated, which it could barely even process tax returns, uh, refunds and collections on time. And Director Choi has gone after actually a lot of those that have been um, not paid and has been very successful. So I just wanted to share that, that we are moving on that path and are hoping to make uh, those pay for their what they've done and um, support the counties and state and their just, uh, a final, final comment just I know from the federal government that they get a tremendous return the more they audit the returns of the cost of auditing is there but the returns on auditing effectively are far superior far greater than the uh, cost of auditing so let's hope that the, that he's aggressive and that you give him the support to be aggressive in that thank you yeah thanks Dave. Yeah, really really, really oh, quickly right. the um the uh, to Senator uh, Decoit's comments about you know the new computer system they did we did put a new system in uh, I want to say three four years ago and that system is now um, starting to show some returns but the the department actually has more tools to be able to go after and track these things so um, that was one of the big um, you know modernizing the state's system in general we have a very 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 old system and um, um, the tax department was the first area we, we updated and then we uh, just gave money to update DAGS's system to uh, keep track of our internal budgeting and things like that. So um, slowly we're, we're, <laughs> we're getting there. Thanks. Thank you for handling the question. I'll get off, let others speak. Thanks, Dick. You know, so uh, one of the questions we got uh, on Facebook from one of our viewers is uh, in regards to broadband service. So uh, according to the uh, person who asked the question, uh, Sandwich Isle and Hawaiian Tail are in Fort while statewide, while Homestead statewide are receiving unstable flow of cell, landline, and internet connectivity. Um, is there anything being done uh, to ensure that our rural communities are receiving 
uh, active broadband service. So maybe we'll go to Senator DeCoy. Senator, I know you've been on many of the broadband HUI meetings and uh, you know, being that you represent many of these rural areas, uh, this is something that you and uh, former Senator English worked hard, especially in East Maui. So can you share just some of the uh, updates or news that you have um, in regards to some of this broadband work? So thank, thank you for that question. Um, as you know, um, you know, it's hard to get broadband and, um, and reliable broadband in these areas of rural. Um, the terrain is very rough. It's unstable. Um, now that Hawaiian Tel actually has the broadband contract, they are working uh, with Hawaiian homes. Um, you know, it's, it's really disappointing that in the amount of money that uh, Sandwich Isles was paid, the service um, within those areas really sucked. I mean, I hate to say it, um, you were allowed if you had a home that was under 10 years old to have that service, but literally the fiber optics were able to cross over your property and you were not able to retain the service. Irregardless of that, you know, having to have those people that relied on the broadband service, they really did not have communications. It was lack of communication. And as we move forward, Hawaiian Telecom, even Spectrum, I think Spectrum actually at that point had put in probably the fastest speed in the HANA area. Um, even then it was a challenge because, you know, there were different towers in those areas that they had to beam off of. So we had tried to work closely with Spectrum even in the isolated areas, which Kalapapa is also inclusive of that. I mean, we were like basically doing patchwork on the homestead areas. I tell you, service was just the worst ever. And yet we still are trying to figure out how to fix it by putting in hotspots, um, by banking off of Hawaiian Telecoms as well as Spectrum. So going forward, uh, trying to work with Hawaiian Telecom and uh, DHHL, uh, in those areas, we are trying to make sure that those protections and measures are addressed because there are a lot of areas in the upcountry that also depend upon it. And, you know, being that those are federal monies, it shouldn't only be isolated just in the homestead areas. Yeah, they also need to be put out in other areas. Um, as school was shut down, the technology was even more evident that we could not even get lessons out to some of the kids in those areas the hotspots that came up, even those weren't working. So having this major contract and the federal government fund it, um, we're talking probably in within the next five years, this is not gonna be a quick, quick fix anytime soon, but we will continue to monitor and work with the different agencies to make sure those that um, we can help, we are trying to help at this time. So thank you for the question. Thanks, Rep. Was there anything you wanted to add to that question in regard to broadband access? Yeah, um, I think uh, as far as, you know, because I think that question was more um, focused on with San Ujail and uh, Hawaiian Telcom taking over the system. But in general, I, I, I think the, uh, what, what makes me very hopeful is that, you know, um, uh, the monies that uh, are, are there for broadband, there's about $115 million that, um, for broadband that came in the uh, the last bucket, and then there's another hundred or so that's coming. I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but um, some monies went to um, uh, DHHL directly, and um, you know th those um, there's there's a lot of pots of money that some went to DOT. Uh, so we're kind of monitoring all of that, and we're trying to figure out how to make that work. Um, you know, work for the state. Thanks. Yeah, I know in the Biden uh, infrastructure bill, you know, I think the latest I heard was that there were going to be over $100 million coming into the state for broadband access. So, uh, you know, the, the difficult thing about those is, uh, you know, we don't get the guidance until six or seven months after. So I think on the current timeline, the state may not be getting the guidance until July. So we'll just kind of wait and see for that one, too. Um, you know, I, I know we did receive a few education questions and I know I do see Fitz is in the room. So Fitz, if you're here, uh, did you wanna ask uh, some of uh, those questions? I wanna make sure I get those questions right. So if you are able to please um, unmute and then you can uh, ask your question. Uh, I just, uh, I was a little late. Uh, I don't wanna cut in line if anyone else has questions. No, go right ahead. 
I it's, don't know what was asked before. Uh, my girlfriend got off work. She's an educator as well, and we needed to walk around the block. To so I think I think part of you know uh, some of the other questions that um, you know both senator and rep answered was you know is in regard to income tax and you know how how do we you know use some of those funds uh, potentially to um, increase the pay for teachers. Um, but I know you did have a few, so wanted to give you the chance uh, to ask. I guess my some of my observations every time. Like, I don't know if you guys notice this, but every time I'm driving down Haleakala Highway to go to Maui Wana, when I'm leaving Maui Wana, there is always a private jet, like, landing at Kahului Airport, like, every time. So there's all this money here on the island, and our schools are crumbling, and just like our roads and bridges, and thank God uh, the federal government passed the bill to increase our roads and bridges and, and bring those, those funds. But um, I guess my question is how, um, well, one of, one of our major goals is every time there's an economic turmoil, uh, the state decides to balance the budget on educators' backs. And this last time was no, luckily there was the rescue plan and all those other plans, but we were facing 20 to 30% cuts in our pay last April and May. And I'm just wondering um, how can we, get all our uh, experienced educators and our veteran educators that have been putting the time in to their proper step. So uh, HSDA calls this compression. So there's educators that have been in the system like 23 to 30 years, and they're getting paid the same as, amount as somebody that's been in the system for 12 or 13 years. So uh, how can we take all these funds? And I, I think there is a surplus a projected surplus, but I'm not entirely sure. I've been trying to keep up, but I think there's a projected surplus, but there's also like the rescue funds and how can we get these educators to their proper step and how can, and yeah, how can we get these educators to proper step? But in addition, um, teachers on average in Hawaii are paid 10% less than someone with a similar degree. So how can we incentivize people to go into the education profession? So like, I wanna incentivize my, my students, but none of my fellow teachers can tell our students, hey, go into education because it'll be lucrative for you and you'll be able to make a difference in a kid's life and also be able to buy a house and also be able to support your family. So how can we make those, like, how can we incentivize and make it so people wanna go into our profession? Because when you look around, there's a lot of, um, uh, experienced educators when you're at a school but there's very few very young educators and we can't even recruit people at the college of education to actually go into teaching even though people want to make differences in young people's lives so how can we incentivize this and how can we do it this year in this legislative session Thank you. thanks fitz uh representative or senator want to take a stab at that okay i'll, I'll start the um I think the difficulty about uh, when when we talk about pay um, is you want to make sure that it's sustainable, meaning that the um, right it's not the one time infusion from the the feds or a a spike in uh, general fund revenue that's a fluke in some way, um, and it uh, in the outer years it may drop and then th that's when we create problems for you and they say well okay now we got to cut the budget, right and and then in general we're cutting it all over the place. Um, so when we, we look at pay, and I think that, you know, that, that's why we have collective bargaining where they, they work out those details. Um, um, and, um, because it, at the end of the day, um, to be fair to the teachers and, and, um, I think we have to look that, uh, make sure that it is a, uh, sustainable or, or ongoing uh, revenue source and not a, just a spike or an infusion from the federal government. But with that being said, I think um, when we do have these spikes, we got to figure out how to improve facilities. We have to do, uh, improve working conditions, improve those kind of things for the teachers, and that's um, there. I I think also important. Um, you know, one of the the good things with the the money that has come in, like you mentioned. Um, is that there was the maintenance of effort um, provision, which basically uh, made it so that we had we couldn't um, 
we couldn't cut or we had to, if we gave an increase to any other department, we had to kind of evenly match it with the department, right? Uh, to be able to get, uh, get the funds from them. So, um, and, and that's, you know, been a very, very tricky thing for the money committees. Um, um, but at the same time, I think it's a good thing uh, because we can, we can uh, figure out, you know, where we can put uh, these resources to, you um, know, at least, like I said, at least make better working conditions or improve the um, uh, schools for our children. And at the, at the end of the day, that's why we're doing all of this, right? Rep, did you want to also go uh, to the point that this past, let us say, this past uh, session, the legislature actually tried to give um, teacher bonuses, right? It was a HB 613, um, mm -hmm. but then the governor vetoed, right? So did you want to kind of go over that uh, one? I to, yeah, I want to thank both of you because I think it was a unanimous vote um, from the legislator and the governor vetoed it, uh, the $2,200 teacher bonus. So I do want to thank both of you for doing that. Um, I also, um, I, it's going to take more than $2,200 because we have 1,100 teacher shortage, at, or we did before the pandemic, and it's just going to be worse. And from my personal experience, what a teacher shortage is uh, in my team at Mauiwena, one of the, like, I think we're the third, second or third largest um, middle school in the, in the state. Uh, but my team, we don't have a math teacher and we, uh, They've been gone, and we have a special, or we have a, a long-term substitute. And every day, my kids, and she's trying her best, like, but every day, my students are saying, "Mr. Fitz, like, all she does is give us the answers. She doesn't explain how to do this." And that's what a long-term substitute is. And we've had 1,100 of these across the state for the last several years, and now it's just going to get worse next year. So how are you guys planning to incentivize educators and teachers to come in and fill these vacancies with high quality educators? Um, we need Senator, to did you want to take a stab at that one, Senator? Yes, so, um, you know, um, of course, Fitz, thank you. You know, we've been trying to um, try and juggle many different situations. And um, there's, you know, I ain't gonna make any excuses. You know, while, uh, you know, the state also took out a loan to help with unemployment um, with the federal government um, just to help people um, get through COVID. You know, I think the, the seriousness behind all of this is one, you know, you have many different factors, right? The incentivizing of it would include, it would be on tax increase. Yeah. And I know people don't want to hear that. It would have to be um, relooking at the budget and where we're literally gonna move money. And are we serious enough to say that it is our teachers and the next generation of kids that we are gonna prioritize? Um, you know, I have two grandchildren, um, you know, and Kyle also has kids that, you know, what do we leave them, right? Do we leave them with um, a disadvantage in the competitive field of work? Do we recruit new teachers? And, or do we continue to be substitutes? I mean, I used to be a substitute teacher and I know what it's like. Like you said, well, let's just give the kid the answer and like move on. So by the time you come back to your classroom, it's like, hey, uh, Mr. Fitz, you know, we don't need to learn anything. Just give us um, the answer. So it's gonna take us to prioritize, is it we're gonna fund more of DAGs and facilities or are we going to beef up the computer systems for the Department of Taxation? I think this needs to be a group effort. Um, I know people do not like to hear, hear about public-private partnerships, but if we are serious about funding our teachers and making sure that we can incentivize, that needs to be brought to the table. I mean, even, um, you know, you sent the email, I read the email, and yeah, when I come down from up country, yeah, these private jets, heck, I'm landing into your um, Kahului airport, some days there's like 25 jets. So how do we get, and we talked about this a little earlier when Dick had asked the question, how do we get the rich to also fork some of these bills? And, you know, Rep Yamashita had brought up a good point that we've discussed several years is that you're gonna have to offset this with property tax because here you have the county being able to manage the tax structure of property taxes. So somewhere along the line, you know, we have to uh, eat it in the front end to offset it in the back end because 
we are also not able to take or should not be able to take preferential treatment. But how serious are we as both state and, and county? Are we serious enough to consider the public-private partnership? Yeah, because as you know, nothing has been working. Uh, we come back to the same thing. We move a bill to have the bill killed. And you know, the frustration is set in. And again, we continue to lose good teachers. So I think that that conversation needs to be brought to the table and it shouldn't be, I don't wanna work with the county. It's about the next generation and how do we keep the next generation and our teachers here in Hawaii. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Oh, Rep. Thank you, Senator. I think um, I, I hear your frustration, but you know your, your frustration is not only for teachers, your frustration is almost with anybody that lives on Maui. Uh, or lives in Hawaii. It's just, yeah, it's just I mean, a high cost nurses, of living. It's with doctors, like doctors can't even afford to live here. And if That's a right. doctor can't afford to live here, yeah. our hospital is not fun. Like, right. like, if a doctor can't afford to live here, like, there's problems. Yeah, so that that's to my point is that I think um, at the end of the day, um, to s subsidize our way out of this is not the answer. The answer has to be how do we um, put... Um, um, things in place that will help us um, stabilize cost of living. And, and a, a lot of that is land-based. So I think, um, you know, um, Senator De DeCoit mentioned property tax and, you know, the uh, HSDA had that bill to give the state uh, the authority to collect for education. But I, I you know, the, and that's kind of heading towards the right, in the right direction. But I think um, uh, what, 70% of our land is local and about th over 30% now, um, it's 30, but probably over by now, um, is owned by people from out of state. And, um, you know, we have the lowest rate in the nation. Um, and when you think about people that are investing um, to buy second properties or vacation homes or whatever, um, and the people that come in on the private jets, it's because... Uh, it's one of the it's it's a bargain to to buy in the state of Hawaii because the rate is so low. Um, and um, on the flip side of that, um, you know, income tax is the highest, uh, one of the highest in the nation. So um, income is only paid for by people that live here. And property is a right a good number of uh, property owners that uh, are paying the lowest. So something's wrong with that system. So I think that when we talk about restructuring and cost of living, that that is um, an area that um, we have to look into. Um, the hard part is, again, like, as I mentioned earlier, is when you make these kind of structural changes, somebody loses and there will be some pushback. Um, and, you know, they, they'll be your neighbors and, and things like that. So um, educating, I think, is the um, everybody on or, or, or getting the information to educate everyone on why this structure is bad, I think is, and, and putting it in a, in a format that is easy to understand and um, easy to explain, I think is uh, where we need to go. Because at the end of the day, uh, it'll have to be um, the general public that pushes policymakers to go in this direction to make it happen. And that's just my opinion. I, Fitz, I know you may have a follow up, but we do have a few other questions from folks that got in. So uh, there should be time at the end. So I'll, if uh, we can push you to, towards the end, but uh, we did get a question uh, regarding the deer uh, situation on Maui. Um, I know Senator, uh, you know, you, you worked with the community to urge the governor to get the emergency proclamation. Can you just Go into detail about you know, what that is, you know, and what should the community expect uh, moving forward in trying to handle the deer situation. So thank, thank you. Um, so basically, the emergency proclamation was requested by the community um, due to the overabundance of access deer. Um, it is a management issue. Um, the deer needs to be managed in a way that is as humane as possible. Um, the request was because you have a heavy influx within the airport areas, um, crops being eaten, pastures being uh, eaten, and you are now dealing with erosion, um, wind erosion, dust erosion, and now that we're moving into the winter months, 
the scarcity of runoff that will eventually suffocate our reefs. I, I'm looking at uh, within the proclamation and the request that I've made to the governor was that it needs to be a group effort of county and state and federal agencies. The request of the task force that was created, and I, I'm not sure, I think uh, Councilwoman um, Sugimura might be on and she created an ag task force addressing these issues. Uh, in early uh, part of January, we had also issued a, a, a proclamation because the situation on Molokai became dire. Um, thousands upon thousands of deer were dying on the side of the road, on people's on doorsteps. The problems we had was as we tried to um, reduce the herds, there were individuals that had said, no, please don't kill Bambi. Um, but then you had those that were dealing with the stench, the smell. We had at that time initiated Dofa John Maderis to come over and site inspection. And he was just uh, taken aback at how bad the situation was. There were literally carcasses all over the road. When that proclamation was ensued, it allowed us to grub in areas to override procurement um, in situations that we would normally need permits to do it. Um, we provided setbacks. These, this was also extended to Maui and Lanai. Um, as you, if you take a look at today on Molokai, the herds have been substantially reduced because of a group effort uh, within its community. Um, those, in this case, the Molokai ranch owners, and I share this with you because you guys have a lot of big uh, landowners and it behooves you not to engage the community of those that are licensed to hunt to come and help you. Because if we constantly just say, oh, I don't want you on my property, um, you deal with you know, many other issues, outlawing and so forth. But in, the whole intention here is to bring those herds down to a healthy herd so that they are not on the roads. We are preventing car accidents by reducing the herds. Um, a call that I got uh, early part of last week was that there were deer on the Kahulu Airport runway. Uh, we had meetings and at that time I had asked the governor, I said, we are in a serious problem because this deer was literally standing in front of a 747 on the Kahulu Airport. Now, this proclamation does not come with funding. Prior to me requesting the emergency proclamation, I had reached out to Congressman uh, Kai Kahele. And I said, if we are to get an emergency proclamation, can the federal government help us? And it would be um, providing funding because when he was here, he saw the damages that was done. I have yet to hear back from the Congressman on whether or not that funding will be coming down. I know in um, Representative Yamashita, you can jump in at any time that he has been spending a lot of time trying to see where there is other funding via the federal government as well. I know the county has put out funds. Um, I think the bigger question that a lot of you have asked us is what has the fund done in Maui? Um, because your herds have continued to grow. Uh, Molokai's one was standing at probably about 50,000. Um, the article of 70,000 I think was far-fetched. Um, so if you went into the Molokai Ranch area. Molokai Ranch was very, very cooperative because I told them, I said, your erosion is going to go into the ocean. Um, you are going to be hit with major fines. I think this is what a lot of our landowners need to look at. If you do not bring those herds down, you are putting a disadvantage with your cattle because most of you fall under USDA pasture management. You'll be in violation. So the the different agencies, be it county, uh, fair, uh, state, and federal, um, the ask is also if you have a situation uh, with deer on your property, that if there's dead deer, we are there to help assist those carcasses. Um, if there need be uh, digs to make sure that they are properly buried, because we don't know what the situation, because we're starting to see starvation. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that um, we can look at doing uh, within working with our communities because we've been getting a lot of emails and calls of hunters that want to help. I'm thinking 
that when the funds were put forward, literally uh, we were paying out on tags. In other words, if you had um, euthanized or in some form hunted that deer, you were to bring the tags back, you were reimbursed uh, for that tag we would then also do a selection via the vet to make sure that there was no type of disease because as we want, uh, many of us consume access deer. So we need to not just kill them, but see how we can utilize them for a food source. Um, our challenges is the inspector. And when Representative Yamashita and I had taken a look at this last year, there are no inspectors out there. I don't care how much money we're putting on to retain these inspectors. We just have a limited um, amount of inspectors out there. So, you know, it's a matter of how do we go forward in corralling, um, making sure there's feed supplements that we can feed them to keep them at healthy levels, consideration of maybe even some sort of um, birth control so that we can keep those healthy herds. And until we start to diminish those herds, then to remove the um, birth control um, so that we can make sure they're at sustainable levels and that we don't uh, remove the cultural aspect of the hunting um, and gathering of those food resources. But that's really what the proclamation uh, puts out there. The task force has also allowed um, communities and people within their expert fields to um, uh, give their mana'o. We have uh, the GMAC guys that also are on the ground um, that talks within the communities. John Maderis, who works for DOFA. Um, Lance De Silva, who also is with DLNR. So, you know, you have a lot of expertise there. It's a matter of us now working together and making sure we can help these landowners um, properly uh, retain and the um, de-escalate what's happening out there in the roads and on the... Um, could could I just add, add one thing? There's mm -hmm. nobody in charge Nobody in charge of coordinating all the management efforts. And I think whether it be Department of Ag or DLNR, somebody at the, who has the state authority with the, more, uh, the uh, thing that you got from the governor, I think you have to have somebody in charge. Otherwise, it just doesn't get done. And that's all the comment I'd like to make. So thanks, Dick. And this is what I did. I reached out to DLNR and because DLNR can only thread in certain areas, um, what I had asked is, why don't you folks just intake the, the data? In other words, if Ulapalakua is, I don't know, putting down 100 head of deer, because we need to know what those numbers are. I know that the county has hired an individual. Um, they await the um, survey. And I said, you know, we're beyond surveys right now. We know that we have an influx of deer. Um, they harbor themselves within the different properties that we cannot access. So, you know, the group effort within this task force that has been created by Councilwoman Tsugimura allows um, lead to be taken, but also the taxpayer dollars to be justified on these monies have been put there. So why are we looking at increased herds? You know, we need to see why those herds haven't been coming down. And I've requested that DLNR be the lead on this. Um, and it should hold well. Um, and I'm hoping that that can be the situation. Yeah. So thank Thanks, you. Senator. Rep, was there anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think the Senator covered most of it. I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think we have everybody at the table. Um, Senator is uh, myself, Representative Clark and uh, Council Member Yukile who put the task force together as far as elected officials in the area that uh, of our country. Um, so I think um, everybody is discussing it. I think uh, the proclamation, okay, I'll just say this about the proclamation. What it, there's, there's no money that came with it, but what it does do also is um, as we go through the process and they say, oh, we cannot do this because of this law, this whatever, it gets rid of the excuses and um, it allows us to move uh, through it quicker. So I think that's the, that's the beauty of the emergency proclamation. Thanks. You know, we do have about five minutes left. So there is one last, there are a couple questions left. So if we can speed through these. Uh, one of them is from Hannibal. Are there plans to use any of the infrastructure money for upcountry water tanks, playa bypass, egg park infrastructure, or upcountry water meter list applicants? Uh, can the state ledge work with our council and mayor to get priority infrastructure work? Uh, so maybe Yamashita as the finance guy. 
Yeah, so I, I, I think um, as Jacob, as you mentioned earlier, it's gonna be um, as this money comes down, you know, how clear the guidance is as far as what we can use the money for and what we can't use the money for. Um, and, and as we get, if that becomes more clear, then we can uh, um, determine where to put the money. I think um, uh, we are having conversations. In fact, um, I've had conversations with DOT um, and, um, and like I said, uh, Senator Schatz's office. And um, we are trying to figure out um, um, what is the best place to start. Um, if we don't get the guidance right away, what is the best educated guess, I guess you could say, where we can start at least some discussion as where to put the money. Got it. And then one last question um, Hannibal had, maybe this one is to Senator, would another slaughterhouse up country help to move the deer to the table? Um, I, I, you know, I think a mobile slaughterhouse would be ideal. The reason why I say a mobile is because deer needs to be a single shot to the head. Um, if you are to try and transport that to an actual slaughterhouse, you will be outside of the realm. It needs to be inspected within the hour. So the, the, the logical thing would be to have something mobile to take it to the site, yeah. And that would make it so much easier. Also to make sure, um, you know, have an area that you can corral it. In other words, because deer is so gamey and wild that they run like a chicken with no head. So you need to have to literally guide them through and versus just whacking them right into a corral area. So that way you, you don't um, inhumanely rough them up because you don't want bruised meat, right? You, you want something that is um, edible and stuff, but yeah, it's very um, strict on the rules of how the kill happens because literally I can give you venison. I can't sell it to you without the inspection. Yeah. Got it. Um, you know, we have three minutes left. So I know Fitz, you had one last question. So if we can keep that one quick, um, I'll give you time. Or do you have a follow-up from your last conversation? Um, I don't know if this is possible, but uh, Representative Yamashita sparked uh, thinking outside the box. And it might, or I've just been thinking about how the Biden administration has been asking uh, um, countries around the world to have a 15% minimum tax rate. And I was thinking about how maybe in Hawaii, I don't know if it's constitutional or not. So this is something to look into, but uh, in Hawaii, we don't ask millionaires and billionaires that hold, own property here to pay uh, income taxes at all. So maybe coming up with a bill to ask them to pay like a certain income tax in the state of Hawaii if they own a property over two or $3 million. So that way their income can actually come to us. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I bet it's not, con uh, it's not <laughs> constitutional. So Kyle Yamashita is probably gonna like tell me that. Yeah, yeah I, I think the uh, difficulty is that by state constitution, the county has control over property tax. Or I think it, you know, that's a stretch to make it income. Um, uh, but you know, I can look into it, but I, like you said, I, I I'm not confident that that's possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I know there we could probably be here all night, but I do want to be. Uh, oh, Fitz. Sorry, just Jeff Bezos in in uh, his new property. He would qualify, <laughs> and to be able to tax him two percent of his income would be pretty awesome. <laughs> that would be. Anyways, yeah, thank you guys. I do want to be uh, respectful of um, everyone's time. Uh, I know we could be here for the whole night, but really appreciate all of you for taking the time and especially thanking uh, Senator DeCoit and Representative Yamashita for holding this town hall. So I'll hand it back over to them for some final remarks and then we'll close out the evening. So uh, maybe we'll start with Senator and then we'll end with Rep for some uh, final words. Well, of course, you guys, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, you know, our office are, is always open. Um, you can catch us by phone, by email. Um, we try to respond in the best way that we can. You know, if you guys have other questions, by all means, um, you know, let us know. We can follow up. I know this was really short. We were just trying to be respectful of everybody and, you know, the dinner time. But, um, you know, we want to look forward to having more conversation. Uh, I know that many of you, when you guys used to come to the Capitol, 
you guys were challenged. So I think Zoom has worked well. Um, you know, it's something that we have now put on the forefront um, as we look forward to going into 2022. Um, you know, I wanted to thank uh, Rep Yamashita. While Rep Yamashita and I, um, we have our um, opinions of each other and our differences, you know, we find that at the end of the day, it's about making sure that, you know, our districts is well um, supported. Um, and, you know, Rep Yamashita is the CIP chair, talk about bringing home bacon to the county of Maui. Um, he does have his challenges because he also has to work with all the other reps across the state of Hawaii. So I wanted to thank you, um, Rep Yamashita, for all you've done for Maui County and of course, all of you that have joined us. And we will be doing a virtual tomorrow with uh, District 13. So by all means, join us and send in your questions and we'll be more than happy to help answer them. And thank you, Jacob. And of course, I'll turn it over to you, Rep Yamashita, mahalo. Okay. Thank you, Senator. And um, thank you for um, being a great partner. You know, I think our differences is, is what makes us stronger together because um, usually say things that I wouldn't say and but I want to say. So it's it kind of good that way. Um, um, I, I, I think the other thing that I wanted to add is that, um, you know, as she mentioned, you know, contact us or contact my office. Um, if I'm if, you know, a lot of times um, this, I've been assigned to all these different special committees and all these different projects. Uh, the finance chair has assigned me to different things that I'm working on statewide. And um, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very busy. This interim has been the most busy I've been all year. So um, if you do have any concerns or comments, uh, please don't feel like when you talk to my staff, it's not getting to me because it does. And um, um, and they do fill me in on exactly what you said or what you wrote or what, so when you call they, they tell me exactly what you said. So um, um, and it's it's just a uh, uh, for me right now it's an efficiency thing. If I can, I will get back to you. But um, if you can correspond with my staff, I'd really really appreciate that because this this interim, like I said, has been a very very busy one for me. Thank you. Okay, thanks guys, um, and thank you for uh, tuning in, um, and uh, we'll see you folks soon. Take care. Take care. Good night. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you.